tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The province cracks down. And let me be clear, these crashes need to stop. BC introduces legislation to usher in strict new penalties in a bid to curb overpass crashes. Plus, wary of what's to come. Residents are honestly at this moment in time, I think, um, frustrated and fearful. The city announces plans to clean up Crab Park, Vancouver's only legal tent city, citing safety concerns. Also, signs of hope at sea. Bigger than normal for this time of year. It's always exciting. You always hope to do good and you always hope it's going to be a, a good year. Some herring fishers are optimistic about early returns that look more promising than they have in years. This is CBC Vancouver News. Hello, I'm Tanya Fletcher. Thanks for joining us. The province is planning to bring in sweeping new penalties for overpass crashes. The maximum fine will jump from $500 to $100,000, and those responsible could spend up to 18 months in jail. Our Mira Baines is at the legislature with more on the bill tabled by BC's Transportation Minister today. BC will soon be levying the toughest fines in the country for drivers who crash into highway overpasses. There have been 35 crashes since late 2021 by overheight commercial vehicles. Let me be clear, these crashes need to stop. This bill seeks to pinpoint enforcement. New legislation has been tabled in the BC legislature and expected to pass. These changes will enable the courts to impose fines of up to $100,000 for drivers involved in infrastructure crashes or a maximum imprisonment of 18 months or both. The maximum penalty aimed at repeat offenders and serious cases is 200 times higher than the $500 penalty that's been in place since the 1970s. The incidents in recent years have caused millions of dollars in damage, supply chain disruptions and posed serious safety risks. Nobody sets out to hit an overpass. Uh, what this does is sends the message to say, you need to be more diligent. You need to pay attention to what you're doing. You need to take the time to do the job right. The United Truckers Association says some truck drivers new to Canada feel pressured by companies to say yes when they should push back on what's asked of them to avoid these types of crashes. What I do believe is that the real cause is the new foreign workers. They are supposed to work with only one particular company. They have to follow to the all instruction. They are only the yes man of their dispatchers, of their companies. Last year, the province brought in penalties targeting trucking companies involved in overpass crashes. The province suspended the operations of Chohan freight forwarders after six overpass crashes in just over two years. Even so, the company continued to operate in Alberta, and it's a loophole the province is trying to close. The province is developing new training materials on measuring load heights. The transportation minister says his ministry is also doing research into making outward facing dash cams mandatory. Mira Baines, CBC News, Victoria. An investigation spanning a year and a half has now led to a second degree murder charge. Surrey RCMP say 38 year old Justin Boss has been charged in the killing of 37 year old Troy Michael Renier. Uh, he was shot multiple times outside a home in August of 2022 and wound up dying from those injuries. The case is now before the courts. Some North Vancouver parents and students are calling out the school district after it changed their schedules. As of September, four high schools will be reverting from the semester system back to a linear system. Under a linear system, students take the same eight courses all year long instead of changing courses each semester. The school district says the decision was made after lengthy discussions with teachers, students and parents. But some say they weren't consulted. This completely blindsided us and we pretty much had no idea about it until they released the news. So as somebody with anxiety myself, um, I've struggled my entire life with it. Juggling eight courses is not going to help that at all. An online petition in favor of keeping the semester system has now more, uh, garnered more than 1,200 signatures. Well, the city and the park board have announced detailed plans to clean up a nearly three-year-old encampment. The tent city at Crab Park along Burrard Inlet is the only legal one in Vancouver. As Chad Pawson reports, the city says it has become unsafe. 
This is the encampment at Crab Park in place since May 2021, protected by a court order in January 2022. Advocates say it's unique in Canada. Because people are able to feel safe in their homes and not have this constant fear of being relocated, they're able to build other things and it's been really wonderful to watch that happen and expand. And even last summer, we were able to have a community garden. There's unease here today, though. That's because Vancouver and its park board say the site is unhealthy and unsafe and needs a thorough cleaning, a reorganization, but don't call it a decampment. This is about um, cleanup of debris and, um, and cleanliness in the area uh, of extensive debris buildup, as well as the compliance with, with, um, with the bylaw notice and operational guidelines. The city says this site, these structures are no longer compliant with rules governing the camp, and that the problem's gotten too big now for individuals to clean up. So crews and machinery are needed. The plan is to have people store their belongings and then move somewhere else on this site to live for two weeks before returning here to improvements and the offer of things like free tents. I don't mind that, but I just don't want them moving everybody out all at once. That doesn't give us any reassurance that they're going to fence it off and we'll be out of a place. Residents are honestly at this moment in time, I think, um, frustrated and fearful. Like, I think there's a big mix of emotions that are going on. Folks that are in this situation without housing um, understandably have uh, a lot of worries and fears and at times distrust of government, whether it's local government or senior government, we recognize that. So as part of the plan, the city will spend the next week getting feedback from residents here and then change the cleanup plan as required. But once people are back, if there is again non-compliance, then the park board's permit to allow this tent city might be terminated. If compliance isn't met and safety concerns continue to be an issue, then that GM notice would need to be revoked and we would make sure that it is in line with any legal ramifications um, and we would explore that. About 50 people who stay in the camp will have a week to pack up before the cleanup begins on March 25th. Chad Pawson, CBC News, Vancouver. The United States and Canada have agreed to work on reducing pollution flowing from BC coal mines into American waters. Researchers say selenium, which is toxic to fish, is being washed downstream from mines in the Elk Valley. In 1985, a report estimated under two tons of selenium had flowed into U.S. waters. By 2023, that number had reached nearly 11 tons. The new agreement involves both federal governments, along with B.C., Montana and Idaho, as well as six Indigenous communities on both sides of the border. It's to our collective benefit, all of us that are involved here, that we find uh, we find answers so that work can continue, but then we also address the, the very serious uh, pollution issues. Researchers will work on finding ways to reduce contamination from BC coal mines, specifically flowing into Lake Kukanusa, a reservoir straddling the national border. The group will be up and running by the end of June and will present their findings in two years. BC's Minister of Mental Health and Addiction says police will be testing the drugs seized in Prince George. But she says at this point there's no evidence of widespread diversion of safe supply opioids. She adds the priority right now is making sure health care practitioners who work with drug users are supported. There are a number of um, steps that health authorities have put in place to ensure that they are um, able to um, better monitor and monitor more uh, earlier for signals that um, individuals may be misusing pres prescriptions. Alberta Premier Daniel Smith and federal opposition leader Pierre Polyev have said the recent seizure in Prince George is an example of safe supply drugs being diverted onto the illicit drug market. Well, BC salmon advocates are once again raising the alarm on the toll salmon farms have had on fish and wildlife. In a report released today, the Watershed Watch Salmon Society says Ottawa is languishing on its promise to transition open net salmon farms from BC by 2025. So we feel that there's a bit of a rift there in terms of what the minister promised and what the department is consulting on. It doesn't make a lot of sense to, to give these uh, salmon farms a six year license when we're still consulting on the transition. However, the head of the BC Salmon Farmers Association says the transition has been misunderstood and does not involve leaving the ocean or the removal of open net pen farms. 
The transition is to find ways to reduce our interactions with wild salmon uh, and further decrease any risk that we may have in with the uh, with the environment. And that is something and a challenge we are completely up for. Uh, and we expect that to happen over a period of time. The association says the same license renewal and expiry process is still in place while the group continues consultations with the government. There are signs that efforts to protect an endangered fish on BC's south coast may be working. Most herring fisheries have been closed in the province since 2021. But as Yvette Bren tells us, a recent strong spawn has experts hopeful for a big return this year. Taylor Forbes wrestles a hose, fills tubs with ice to pack fish. We always hope it's going to be a, a good year. In his six decades of fishing, Forbes' grandfather Billy has watched herring returns dwindle due to overfishing, pollution and habitat changes. As long as you're ready, you let Mother Nature decide. Each spring, herring turn coastal waters bright turquoise with their milt or sperm. Most Pacific herring fisheries have been closed since 2021 in an effort to protect wild salmon which rely on herring for food. This year, their numbers are forecast to increase significantly. They've even shown up early in some areas thanks to El Nino. Biologists are cautiously optimistic. Overall, it's you know a bit of a mix, but uh, generally, if you look at stocks coastwide as a whole, we have seen an increasing trend over the last 10 years. Scientists are examining what exactly has helped the species. It's early days for this kind of work, but I have to say the uh, indications are extraordinary because it means, you know, if you've got herring, you've got everything. Herring feeds salmon, fish that in turn feed BC's endangered orcas. The fish is also part of the indigenous traditions and fisheries. Uh, it definitely offers hope. Um, you know, what we've seen though, you know, in our territory has been decreases. But not every provincial coastline can expect a rebound. For this First Nation, stocks are expected to decline this spring. We wanted to be able to see the uh, returns in, you know, in great abundance. The hope is one day all coasts will see a robust spawn. We've had some early spawns out there for some reason, and they're bigger than normal for this time of year. His nets are ready in the hope that nature offers an abundant haul. Yvette Bren, CBC News, Vancouver. Our Darius Madavi is here with a look at the forecast. And Darius, save for a few showers in the morning, it certainly felt like those first signs of true spring on the horizon. It did. Uh, there was a little bit more activity on parts of the island than here in Vancouver, but really across the south coast, we are calming down. We're seeing that last little bit of precipitation coming through, and after that, we are calming down. Uh, the one thing to still watch out for would be some pretty strong winds uh, in the uh, in the strait around Victoria and the Gulf Islands, maybe in Vancouver as well. That should start to calm down over the next few hours as well. And by tomorrow morning, mostly calm. The strong winds then will be up off the north coast of the island. But after that, pretty much uh, looking at the, everything really tapering off. High pressure system moves in. No more precipitation, or at least very little to speak of in the next 24 hours. After the next 24 hours, nothing whatsoever on the south coast. A little bit coming to the north and central coast. We'll have a look at that later this hour. But for now, get, just expect that little tiny bit of rain, the tiny bit more snow still to come for some of those mountain ranges, and then not really anything else. And in fact, those freezing levels are really going to rise as we see the temperatures climb across the south coast and Vancouver Island over the next few days and into the weekend, where temperatures in many places could approach 20 degrees doesn't quite look like we're going to make it on the south coast, although for parts of the southern interior they will. Uh, we're going to see those temperatures really come up along with those freezing levels. So freezing levels pretty much jumping up to uh, 3,000 meters by the end of this week. So be ready for that. And beyond that, enjoy a little bit of a cooler morning, but should warm up by noon. And the only other thing to mention is that we're getting a lot more sunshine, about an hour of sunshine added to our days in the next two weeks. Love that. Thanks so much, Darius. Thanks, Daniel. It's a creative attempt to incorporate traditional Indigenous languages into the education system. A woman from the Williams Lake First Nation has helped create flashcards to teach kids in her community the Sequet machine language. Here's a look at some of the flashcards that were given out at a recent baby welcoming ceremony. Words like Ren Jajaja, which is uh, my little sister. Ren Sisunja is my younger brother. We've been trying to incorporate language, support machine, as much as we can. 
into our programming. And so we came up with this idea with the um, flashcards. And so we have family terms, states of beings, greetings, um, clothing, colors. Great, great is uh, it's actually a hard cue. So it's like at the back of your throat on the top, it's, um, and it means blue. I think it would just be mind blowing to have, you know, these little ones running around, you know, instead of saying, that's my brother, that's my uh, Ren Squisessa. We're trying to incorporate language where we can, when we can, so then that way, hopefully one day they'll be fluent. Gakcha, their father, Kmut, which is hat. I feel like I'm a baby in the language right now. So it's it's nice to have these to refer back to. Like Ren Gakst is my older brother. Even with the parents, like, you know, because everyone's yearning to learn the language and they want simple words, basic terms that were easy to say. And if they wanted to learn, we would be able to teach them as well. Like Ren's, uh, them geckles is my daughter. You know, it's something that will last a lifetime. It is something that we are bringing back because there was a time that we weren't able to speak our language. You know, and this is something that is, you know, being revitalized. It's, it's a living thing. It's a, probably one of the most important things in our lives is language. It's how we conversate. I've been wanting to learn my language for years. And then, you know, I had the opportunity last July to start classes and I've been taking classes ever since. I think I feel a little bit more connected to the land. It's something that I've wanted for so long. I feel more connected to my parents, to my dad, who was Sukhwatm. Ren Gikaha is my mother. Ren Geek is my older sister. I would suggest taking classes. <laughs> Up next, with reservoirs at record lows, BC Hydro has had to resort to buying power from both south of the border and our province next door. So is it time to diversify how we generate power in this province? We'll explore that after the break. And thank you for staying with us during our commercial-free live stream. The 15th annual Scotiabank Girls Hockey Fest returned to Winnipeg over the weekend. Players of all ages hit the ice with some of their hockey heroes. Former broadcaster and national team captain Cassie Campbell led an on-ice training session. The goal is to get more girls into the sport and encourage them to stick with it. Check it out. It's our 15th year in Winnipeg and uh, continues to grow the game and, and it's been an unbelievable program over the years. There's all different groups. We have an elite group. We have a learn to play group. Um, I think the learn to play group, we just saw them and you know some of them have never had a pair of skates on before and been on the ice. So they're trying hockey for the very first time and they're with people that are sort of at the same level as them. So I think it helps them feel a little bit more comfortable. So we learned about how to be a good teammate and we did some practicing on skills and yeah. What was your favorite part? Um, I don't know, all of it. For a lot of the new players we were kind of just working on some basic skills like puck handling or just skating, getting the feet off the ice or just passing back and forth, just some of the basic stuff. Well, I think it can definitely be tough for, for girls getting into the sport at, at the beginning, but I mean, right now we're at uh, a really good time for women's hockey with the PWHL starting, so it's good to see a lot more girls getting into hockey, especially at a young age. When I played, you had to play with your brother, right? I mean, there were the boys' teams, and um, there weren't a lot of girls' hockey teams around, and I think over my career, it just continued to grow and grow, and, you know, when I retired, you're just starting to see it grow and grow, and, you know, especially when you come back to centres like Winnipeg, and, you know, from 15 years ago to what we're seeing today, our first group was the youngest, and there's a lot of talent here in Manitoba, so it's just fun to watch the game get better and better. It's fun to see more opportunities uh, for young girls to play, and um, it's fun now that they get to watch their heroes with the Professional Women's Hockey League on a regular basis, too. You know, 
these girls are going to get to watch them on TV every other night. And I think that's really important uh, for them to see these great women on a regular basis and to say, you know what, maybe one day I can grow up and, and play professional women's hockey. All the girls that I know that are from Manitoba, Sammy Jo Small, Jennifer Bottrell, Jocelyn LaRock, and Kristen Campbell, the list goes on and on. They've done a really good job of being role models in this province. And uh, you can tell because there's a lot of great goalies, first and foremost, but just you can just see at a young level they can skate better. They're just more skilled. You know, they, they've been introduced to the game in different ways than maybe I, I was. So um, kudos to this province for producing, continuing to produce great hockey players. We continue our look at the ongoing drought situation in this province, the effects we're seeing right now, and some of the challenges that may lie ahead this spring and summer. One place we're already seeing that impact is power generation. BC Hydro says reservoirs are low, and that's causing ripple effects. With the Site C Dam about to go online and start generating power, the province should be looking at much more power in its system. But the utility has had to import electricity from south of the border and Alberta. And while it can offset some of those costs by buying power when it's being sold on the cheap and selling back when it's going more, uh, there is still worry about the season ahead. And now BC Hydro is hoping to generate more power and in different ways. Joining me now is Kwatuma Sires. He's executive director of Clean Energy BC and a member of the Hupetchaset First Nation. So Kwatima, what are you watching specifically as BC heads into the spring and summer season in regards to power generation? Uh, well, I'm looking at BC Hydro's uh, call for power. They've issued uh, the first call for power in 15 years. So it's, it's, uh, it's scary with droughts, you know, showing us that, you know, climate change is here, it's impacting our infrastructure. Um, but it is an exciting time because we are taking actions right now to ensure that we're going to have uh, clean energy when we need it. Because um, even when CIC comes online, we're still going to need more power. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue to need more power. Um, and so it's, it is an exciting time in that sense. It's hard to get excited about droughts and everything. So it's showing us that, you know, that, that we need to diversify our, our electricity production. And certainly with this call for power, we're going to see that. We're going to bring on cost-effective options in terms of wind and solar into the grid so that mm -hmm. we can help make sure rates remain affordable, clean, um, and environmentally responsible. Yeah, l let's talk more about that. It seems BC Hydro has put all of its eggs, you might say, in the hydroelectricity basket. Uh, they seem to be moving to create a more robust system, but is this all moving fast enough given those demands we're going to see? That is the question is, you know, do we, can, we have to match our efforts with the pace of electrification. And this is what we're seeing everywhere, in all jurisdictions all across the world, where we need to, we need to figure out how we're going to reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions, meet our climate targets, while also safeguarding our, our economy from climate change and, and make sure our economy is competitive and we can attract capital. These are all very difficult, especially when you want to keep things affordable. That's why it's key to bring in more clean energy into our grid so that we have you know, a, di a diverse range of clean energy, but also that we're actually going to be able to meet our electricity uh, needs mm -hmm. in the future. Striking that balance, the, the magic task. Uh, with a shortage of power, is it cheaper and faster uh, to restart traditional energy creation infrastructure? We'll give the example of, say, restarting a power source like the Burrard, a generating station. Do you think BC Hydro perhaps mothballed that facility a little too quickly? Well, I think what's important for viewers to, to think about when we consider, you know, uh, natural gas is that, you, you know, we should consider the energy transition and moving towards the new economy that moves towards our strengths, which is clean electricity, that where corporations will want to invest here to meet their ESG targets and ensure that there are high-paying jobs here in British Columbia, like the Emoli $1 billion investment here in the lower mainland. Mm. We want to see more of that. In order to do that, we need more clean elect electrons. And so... Moving, to, moving towards like those old technologies, 
kind of makes it more difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. And finally, do, do small projects make sense financially? I mean, what are the trade-offs between big infrastructure projects, things like Site C, and smaller, more diverse projects? Yeah, well, this is the exciting part. You know, the province has put forward $140 million to support uh, what will likely be First Nations-led projects mm -hmm. that are distribution scale. Uh, but with this call for power, we're going to see bigger utility scale wind and solar. And with those, with that size projects, we're going to see uh, economies of scale. So costs are going to come down. Wind, solar, they've come, the costs have come down over the past decade of 90 or 90 percent for solar, 70 percent for wind. And we see it other markets like Alberta last week, when renewable energy comes on, prices come down. Mm -hmm. um, so it's um, certainly an exciting time for our industry. We're, we're excited to have opportunity to bring these clean, affordable projects into BC. Um, well, we certainly appreciate all your insight on this. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you. That's Kwatuma Sires, Executive Director of Clean Energy BC. Well, coming up, at least 50 people are injured after a traumatic flight on a Boeing jet with some passengers thrown right to the ceiling. We'll tell you what went wrong and the renewed push for the company to correct course. Stay with us. Food insecurity is a major, major uh, problem in our community. And just, I'm not even just talking about Muslim community, it's like everyone. Ramen for dinner is not dinner, really, right? Um, so we have students, um, we have people in the community with low income or modest income, and especially those that fall through the cracks and do not qualify for like social assistance and stuff like that, for whatever eligibility reason, right? So um, when they cannot get help from those places, um, especially. Um, so our program, we can help them. Just being able to help out, it's it's an amazing thing to do. And, you know, just uh, doing as much as we can, giving out as much as we can, it means a lot because, you know, like if you're blessed with something, you should give more. And so that's what I've always been taught by my, you know, elders. But eggs. Today is a monthly hamper distribution. So we have about 100 clients um, currently for MES. Um, we had about 25 last year, so you could see that this has grown to like four times, uh, which tells us about two things. Food insecurity is a real problem in the community that affects everyone, irrespective of who you are, um, what religion, what country, what ethnicity. It hits everyone the same. Um, but at the same time, we are blessed that the Muslim Middle of Saskatchewan, MAS, we have the means to be able to help at least 100 clients. Um, so what, what happened today is we had volunteers that came in um, a little bit early. They had already ordered um, the grocery from um, a store that um, we have a like, partnership with. Um, and then they came here, packed it one by one, and as clients came by, they just like took it home. At least that's one less thing for them to worry of having a hamper. Um, and then they can take over the home. At least reduce the grocery bill to some extent, so providing some relief to some of those people.
Welcome back. Dozens of people are injured after a Boeing airplane suddenly plummeted in the sky yesterday, launching passengers from their seats. And it comes just weeks after a door panel flew off a Boeing flight mid-flight. As the CBC's Thomas Degla is finding out, an investigation has reportedly found dozens of flaws in the company's manufacturing process. Passengers were thrown to the ceiling on this flight from Australia to New Zealand, with at least one seen here attended to on the floor mid-flight. It felt like, uh, you know, when you are in a roller coaster and you just go like this. This Dreamliner, flown by Chilean airline Latam, abruptly dropped more than 300 feet, leaving 50 people injured, several sent to hospital. I just realized I'm not in a movie. This is actually for real. Canadian Brian Jokit was on the flight and took these pictures showing emergency crews boarding the plane after it landed in Auckland. The pilot came to the back and I said, uh, what was that? And he openly admitted, he said, I lost control of the plane. My gauges just kind of went blank on me. It's the latest in a string of terrifying incidents involving Boeing jets. A tire fell off this 777 taking off from San Francisco last week, smashing cars below. That Alaska Airlines MAX 9 that saw a door panel blow out in January is prompting investigations and more scathing criticism of Boeing. They need to uh, go through a serious transformation here uh, in terms of their responsiveness, their culture, and their quality issues. The New York Times reports the plane maker recently failed 33 out of 89 audits carried out by U.S. regulators. Boeing tells CBC News in a statement, we continue to implement immediate changes and develop a comprehensive action plan to strengthen safety and quality. Boeing culture has changed over the last 15 or 20 years, uh, and it's showing up in terms of the issues that we're having with this new generation of airplane. Airlines, including WestJet, are awaiting their new MAX planes, but the company is slowing production as the FAA demands a plan from Boeing by this spring to address concerns over quality and safety. Of the CBC's Thomas Dagla reporting, and now Susan Ormiston takes us through Boeing's bumpy ride over the past five years and asks the question, is flying those planes any safer now? For Boeing, the new year began with a blowout. I hear this boom. I look to my left and part of the plane is gone. At 16,000 feet, a door panel on Alaska Airlines Flight 1282 disappeared, leaving a gaping hole. Alaska or Seattle, Alaska. 1282, we just did press air, so we're declaring emergency. We need to descend down to 10,000. Looking at the flight attendants' faces, it was clear to me this wasn't going to go well. The 737 MAX 9 depressurized. Oxygen masks dropped and passengers feared the worst. Yes, we are emergency, we are depressurized. We do need to return back to, we have 177 passengers, we're 18-8. So I quickly realized I need to pivot and start messaging to people to say goodbye. No one was sitting next to the panel, but a young man two seats over had his shirt sucked out the opening. The heavy cockpit door blows open the pilots said that their headsets were ripped off. There's a checklist up here. This thing gets shoom, blown out the door. The cockpit is filled with noise, and there's all kinds of debris blowing out of the cockpit. But now we're down to My eyes are glued to that opening, and I'm just wondering what's going to happen next. I I'm not prepared for this. I wasn't prepared to die on this flight. Plus, the 42 pulling power wind, 160 F11, runway 28 left, straight the plane landed, no one was critically hurt. But for Boeing, its reputation was questioned once again, five years after its worst crisis ever. We were on the scene back then. Five years ago, we went to Ethiopia, where ET-302 dove into the ground, and among the victims, 18 Canadians. In the aftermath, Boeing promised to change the corporate culture, to fix the planes and restore trust. But has it? Five years later, is Boeing any safer? So here we are, a familiar place for you. Uh, just a little bit. 
Dennis Tager flies Boeing 737s for American Airlines. Action switch on. In a simulator, he shows us how the Alaskan Airlines pilots may have reacted. You don't know what happened. Did someone have a bomb back there? Did the piece that blew off the airplane hit another part of the airplane? This is happening in seconds. And had the plane been higher at cruising altitude, the situation would have been far worse. When that door blows open, we're not talking about shirts just being ripped off from just near the door. It's a massive suction that comes out of the airplane. And who knows what could have gotten sucked out of the airplane, including people. When the door blew off the Alaska flight, once again, the doors blew off Boeing. How in the world could this happen? We had the same question after covering the two MAX 8 crashes five years ago. In 2018, it was a Lion Air flight that dove into the sea. Just five months later, the Ethiopian Airlines flight plunged into the ground. <laughs> two catastrophic crashes, both 737 MAX 8 aircraft killed 346 people. Ever since, the U.S.'s Federal Aviation Authority has been monitoring the 737 MAX production, a colossal moneymaker for Boeing, MAX aircraft flown all over the world. In February, the FAA published a scathing report on Boeing's safety culture, even before the Alaska Airlines blowout. The events of, of January 5th, it, it really created two issues for us. One, what's wrong with this airplane? Uh, but two, what's going on with the production uh, at Boeing? The FAA sent inspectors onto Boeing's assembly line and ordered it to slow down the production of new 737 MAX planes. While investigators pieced together how a door panel could drop from the sky, how four bolts were missing on the door plug, how the 737 MAX 9 flew for two months before the panel ripped off. Passengers have already launched lawsuits as Boeing's CEO tries to blunt criticism. We feel that safe airplanes, our people do. We have confidence in the safety of our airplanes. And that's what all of this is about. And we fully understand the gravity. So when you heard about the Alaska Airlines problem, what was your first thought? Shock. Uh, and to have this happen um, on a brand new airplane, 10 weeks old, um, was a shock to me. We asked John Gradick, an aviation management professor at McGill University, about Boeing's newest crisis. What would you say was the reputational damage for Boeing and the MAX aircrafts? Uh, it is a huge blow to Boeing. Boeing has a mindset um, of operational and financial performance that they are very much focused today uh, on return to their shareholders. They're focused on the economics of building an airplane. And the latest Alaska Airlines incident still has a lot of people asking, you know, has Boeing fixed itself? And the answer is probably no. Oh, would you like me to hold one? Yeah. Sure. For the families who lost loved ones in those catastrophic crashes years ago, the latest problems with Boeing have only triggered new emotions. the CBC Susan Ormiston reporting. Still to come, it's only March, but Quebec has been forced to issue a fire risk bulletin. Snow is melting too early and there's little precipitation still falling. What this means for the upcoming fire season after the break. Just took a deep breath and went. I thought it would be worse than it was. The very first polar plunge. I wanted to do it for our athletes. Being a part of Special Olympics, they belong. Being in the regular stream of sports doesn't necessarily fit for them. They don't need. They don't um, shine like they do here. Every everybody was uh, was there for a great cause. And the smiles on everybody's faces, the cheering. Well, that was amazing. The people there, everybody that did the plunge. Um, the mother-daughter team was awesome. <laughs> Me and my mom had costumes. We did Hawaiian dresses and a luau necklace. 
they do a lot of stuff for Special Olympics. We it's definitely very helpful for them and they fundraise a lot. So I'm glad we were able to help with it. So I just jumped in and went for it. I blacked out. <laughs> It was so cold. Job, uh, years ago, I first started working in the rehab field, and um, the Special Olympics were definitely something that you know they looked forward to with their bowling, and it was a sense of community for them, and it was very good to see them all work together, and it was something to be proud of. This, this is a good organization. They do wonderful things for people with disabilities. Go! It started last last uh, summer, and I met everybody with soccer on that team and it was really great so I stayed it's like making friends and getting to know new people and having fun they are here for each other they're cheering each other on dive right in get it doing it is it's exhilarating it's great for you um, and all for a good cause <laughs> Hey, I'm Rohit Joseph. Vibin' is the new show all about discovering great new songs and fresh artists from across BC and beyond. Stream Vibin' on CBC Listen. Welcome back. Taking you overseas, a key mediator in the attempts to get a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war says a deal is still a long way off. I can't offer any timeline, sadly, at, uh, at the moment. The situation is very complicated on, uh, on the ground. Uh, the, we are not near uh, a deal, meaning that we are not seeing uh, both sides converging on, uh, on a language that can uh, resolve the, you know, the current disagreements over the implementation of, um, of the deal. But there are new developments in the efforts to get aid into Gaza. A jetty is being built for the first food delivery by sea to the territory. That shipment is sailing from Cyprus and is expected to arrive in a couple of days. The U.S.-based charity World Central Kitchen is a key organizer and will be distributing the food in Gaza. Details about how exactly that will be done logistically are still being worked out. Well, back in our country, a dry winter is sparking worries about what the upcoming wildfire season will look like. Quebec is now preparing for its season earlier than ever before. Well, in Alberta, the wildfire season has already started. As the CBC's Alison Northcott is finding out, the memories from last year's record-breaking season are still fresh. When wildfires surrounded the Cree First Nation of Waswanapi last summer, residents had to leave their homes twice. It was the first time that we had to evacuate for a forest fire in many, many years. Now, after a drier than usual winter in Quebec, the community is preparing in case that happens again. We know what to do now, unfortunately. That's the sad thing. We, we do know what, what to do. We, we do know how to evacuate the most vulnerable populations of our community. Last year, Canada's wildfire season had the largest and most intense fires yet. Record-breaking is almost a euphemism. I mean, it was... Uh, it really shattered past records, um, so it's, uh, we've learned a lot. And fire prevention agencies are concerned about what this year could bring. 
In Alberta and B.C., some fires from last year were never fully extinguished, and there are already new ones burning. We didn't have the precipitation that we would normally see over the winter, so we're already at 100 times the amount of area burned uh, this year than we would normally see. Alberta is bringing in firefighting staff early. Quebec is too. Its fire prevention agency issued a fire risk rating for southern Quebec last week, earlier than ever before, amid quickly disappearing snow. A few hours of sunshine uh, and if you had some winds to it, uh, it's going to get dry very quickly. So it's going to become uh, very, very uh, easy to start a fire. He says fire risk over the coming months depends a lot on how much precipitation there is this spring. But Alberta Wildfire says even if they get rain, it might not be enough to help. We will still be in high or very high or extreme wildfire danger in part of the province. Fire prevention agencies are watching the weather closely. Experts say climate change has increased wildfire risks around the world and that Canada is no exception. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. And Darius Madavi is back with the full forecast. And Darius, it uh, feels like that heat and uh, the sunshine are on the way, but it looks like you still got some uh, precipitation on your screen there. Yeah, a little bit of activity still in the interior. That's clearing up as well. Really, in the next few days, the only place we're going to be seeing that is the north and central coast. Uh, even the central coast, only a small chance we see some precipitation there after tomorrow. For the North Coast, though, it should be pretty consistent over the next couple of days. But by the weekend, it's most likely that they'll be drying up as well. For today, you can see there were some showers across places like the Okanagan Valley, up in the Thompson, uh, and really moving across that uh, across that region, continuing to move west now, that or east, sorry, that frontal system rolling through. And as that continues to move out, it's really going to be the last thing we see for a while in the more southern parts of BC. So really going to be drying up and, as you said, warming up, which will be a, a bit of a, a bit of a change. Now here in the north, in the, on the north coast and in the northwest, that's really the last place we're going to be seeing some of that precipitation over the next few days. A decent accumulation on some of those mountains. Uh, this is the place in the province where we do have the most snowpack already, so uh, not doing, uh, not, not, not a problem to get more there, but uh, we could use it in some other parts of the province. Not likely to see that for the next week or so as things are looking quite dry and that is going to be the case for a while. But temperatures though, they're going to continue climbing. Those freezing levels are going to shoot up, meaning we may see some snow melt. Avalanche risk may continue to stay high, will likely continue to stay high because we have that unstable layer that formed when we had that cold snap followed by a really warm period back in January. And now the warm temperatures are only going to sort of exacerbate that risk. So uh, we may have those slab avalanche risks as well as some other ones because of that, uh, those layers melting on the top as well. But with that being said, uh, still temperatures going to climb. Many people in the south going to enjoy that warmth and that sunshine over the next few days, including tomorrow where we're going to see mostly sunshine. A lot of these places that cloud should clear out in the morning. The only place again, the north, uh, the northwest, and then also the southeast, really just the, uh, the East Kootenai is going to see a little bit of that rain tomorrow. If we zoom in here in BC, I'm going to talk a little bit more just quickly about those, uh, that, that daylight that we're going to see because the equinox is one week from today. We're going to see the start to spring. We're going to see that, uh, that 12 hour day that marks the beginning of spring. And that means that from this week until two weeks from now, or today from until two weeks from now, we're going to see a massive increase in the amount of daylight we get around 52 minutes here in Vancouver. But the further north you go, the more of that daylight you're going to get and the more quickly you're going to get it. So very consistent sunny forecast as the days stay longer. So it's sunny and the sun's out longer. It's been a long time since we've seen a board like that. Thanks so much, Darius. Thanks, Tanya. Still ahead, it's that time of year again. Beautiful blue waters, courtesy of Herring Spawn. After the break, we'll dive into why they turn the water that stunning color. Stay with us.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver's Benit Brach at the Alumni UBC webinar, Build the Future with Gen Z, April 3rd. A panel of Gen Z UBC students and alumni will share their views and experiences about their cohort's values and aspirations, approaches to work, and more. And never miss a special programming series, event, or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox. She may not have won an Oscar on Sunday night, but actress Lily Gladstone has made her mark. The Indigenous performer has been making history throughout this award season. And as the CBC's Magda Gabor Selassie tells us, she's been sharing the spotlight on the red carpet with Indigenous designers. Lily, can we have you on this way? Lily Gladstone's red carpet looks stunned and inspired, putting Indigenous designers on the same stage as some of the world's best-known luxury brands. I am wearing Joe Big Mountain with uh, Gucci. The Killers of the Flower Moon star has made award season history. The Sixagate Setapi and Namipu actor is the first Indigenous performer to win the Golden Globe for Best Actress in a Drama and the first to earn the SAG Award for an outstanding performance by a female actor in a leading role. Along the way, in magazines and on the red carpet, she's been wearing Indigenous designs, bringing the bling in beaded jewellery and striking a pose in standout looks. Among those that made the cut to dress the star is Anishinaabe designer Leslie Hampton. Hampton, who is based in Toronto, designed this look worn by Gladstone in Variety magazine. So this is what we sent. And this dress as an option for the star to consider for the Oscars. It's so exciting to be able to have that connection with Lily um, and to celebrate her massive achievements and moments that are happening right now, not only for her, but for Indigenous people. And it's an exciting time for the many Indigenous designers tapping into new or traditional methods. You'll see that with like quill work and bead work and uh, ribbon skirts. Sage Paul says what's happening in fashion right now is monumental. To see Indigenous made garments and fashion and accessories on the red carpets, on the runways, even Indigenous models, it's inspiring. Uh, we can see younger generations be seeing themselves represented in those spaces. They too could one day make their own mark on future award seasons to come. Magda Gebrasilesa, CBC News, Toronto. As we told you earlier, it's herring spawn season, and early returns are signaling an above-average year for the fishery. But it's not just humans moving in for a feast. The herring spawn are also an opportunity for other animals as well. Connell Bradwell and Emily Robertson break down why the spawn is key to a healthy wildlife population. Every spring around Vancouver Island and along the coast of BC, the ocean suddenly turns turquoise. Why is that, Connell? Oh, well, <laughs> there's no glamorous way of saying it. It's a lot of fish sperm, also called milt. Today, we are talking about the herring spawn. As the season begins to change in BC, one of our most abundant fish species migrates from the offshore waters to nearshore bays and estuaries to spawn. It's the Pacific herring, and this spawn produces one of the most spectacular natural events along the coast, often referred to as the northern lights of the ocean. When the fish arrive, the males release milt, a milky substance that contains sperm, into the water, turning the coastal ocean a stunning turquoise color. Female herring will coat the seaweed, eelgrass, rocks, and everything else on the shoreline with a thick layer of tiny transparent eggs. The scale of this event is hard to quantify. There can be up to six million eggs per square meter. Unlike the salmon, the fish don't die here. After three weeks of spawning, the herring return to the open ocean, and this cycle can occur five to 10 times throughout their lifetime. Pacific herring are the foundation of the coastal food web, and there are very few species that don't eat it. The herring spawn is the first big influx of food of the year for a diverse range of marine predators. That includes marine mammals, fish, invertebrates, and my favorite, the birds. Around the spawn areas, gulls gather in their thousands. And just like any area with a lot of gulls, it's chaos. The gulls forage on both the eggs and the fish themselves and can consume two thirds or more of the eggs that are exposed on the beach during low tides. You can see that gulls aren't the only bird species that are here. Other birds like wading birds, songbirds, and ducks also feed on the eggs. 
Some birds even time their migrations to coincide with the herring spawn. And the herring eggs are used as fuel to get them to their breeding grounds, some of which are as far away as the Arctic. We've been seeing hundreds of bald eagles in this area. Eagles start nesting early here on the coast, so the adults need to be in good condition for this. The abundance of food is important for both the adult eagles with the white heads and the younger eagles who are all brown. While the younger eagles aren't building nests right now, they are still very hungry after a long winter with only little amounts of food. And this is what the herring spawn does for birds. Towards the end of the winter, their energy levels are at a low. This feeding frenzy helps to top them up so they can go on and have a successful breeding season. So a lot of the marine birds that we see in the spring and the summer are only really around because of the herring spawn. Where I live on Vancouver Island, we get a lot of sea lions and filming them is a lot of fun. Sea lions love herring and the spawn attracts thousands of them. They're staking out territory on the rocks where they lounge around before diving into the ocean waters to feast on the herring. After they're done feeding, they raft together and continue to just gorge on the fish. Just like the birds, the sea lions head to different breeding sites all along the BC coast. The herring spawn is really important for them. It gives them the fat reserves they need to breed. The success of the herring spawn directly affects the reproductive success and health of these migrating animals. And that's the case for everything from fish to birds to sea lions, all the way to whales. Like so much on this coast, there's an interconnection between the land and the ocean. The fish spawning event that is perhaps most famous is the salmon run, where we see a huge transfer of nutrients from the ocean to the land. And the herring spawn is no different to this. These nutrients are spread throughout the forest by the predators that feed on them. So for example, if a gull or an eagle eats herring eggs or the herring themselves on the beach, they then deliver those nutrients to the forest by pooping as they fly over. After the hatching period, dead eggs and casings in shallow waters move with the waves and tides. This can deliver the eggs to the intertidal and coastal ecosystems as they decompose, again providing the area with a huge amount of nutrients. Oh, and talking of salmon, herring are actually a really important food source for the salmon themselves. So that means that a good herring spawn can often mean we get a good salmon run. The importance of the herring spawn as the foundation of the food web means that its impacts carry on throughout the spring, summer, and beyond. Filming the chaos of the herring spawn has been an unbelievable experience, and witnessing this brief spectacle has been so special as it really only lasts for a few days before it's gone. This natural phenomenon is crucial for a healthy ecosystem and a diverse range of life that exists here on the coast of British Columbia. I saw you eyeing up that puffin sweater he was wearing. And that is your news for this Tuesday, March 12th. For news anytime, anywhere, download the free CBC News app. You can always find us online at cbc.ca slash bc. And we'll be back with your next local newscast at 11 o'clock right after the National. Good night. Good night.